everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melanie, and I'm a research associate at the Bear Center. Um, as Abby referred to earlier, it stands for Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman. And what we do at Bear is we study how real people behave. So we don't think of people as perfectly rational agents who are only focused on economic goals, who are always forward-looking and unemotional, but rather we think of them as regular people, you know, like you and me, who um, sometimes forget, who procrastinate, and often freeze at the face of complexity. So this particular research done um, with Professor Dilip Soman and my colleague Jessica Ahn was really sparked by the huge increase in the number of things that we do online, like shopping, investing, and even taking standardized tests. In particular, we had one simple question, which is when we make decisions online, are we using the same decision-making model that we would in a bricks and mortar environment? Or does the online environment fundamentally change how we make decisions? And so to answer this question, we reviewed a lot of research from different faculty, some our own at Rotman. And our answer to this question is yes. <laughs> so decision making in the online world is not simply a digitization of decision making in the bricks and mortar world. In fact, we find that it is a completely different playing field with different sets of rules. So what is so different about online? Well, there are three um, drivers of the differences. Screens, you know, we make decisions using screens instead of um, in front of you know, a human being. We're more connected to what other people are doing because it's so easy to observe other people's behavior. And also we have tools called choice engines at our disposal to help us make um, decisions. So let's start with screens. It turns out that we're much more honest in front of a screen. So research shows that when people are asked questions about their various habits, like smoking or exercising, they were much more honest when the format of the question was a text on a screen rather than a human voice. So as you can see, almost 30% more people admitted to ever being a smoker, and almost twice more people admitted to being sedentary, so exercising in this case less than once a day. And other research shows similar effects of screens on you know, bringing out honesty in people from you know, admitting poor academic performance to reporting drinking habits or to reporting the number of sexual partners they have. So you, know, you can imagine a world where instead of having doctors ask patients about their bad habits or other sensitive information, you can have screens ask them. Doctors are, you know, they would be happy to not have this uncomfortable conversation, and the result would actually be much more accurately re um, reported information from the patient's part that can really um, help doctors better um, help the patients. Well, this um, feeling of anonymity that people feel on screens is actually a double-edged sword, though, because it turns out that people, uh, or screens make people um, indulge in more un in uninhibited behavior. So let's take pizza orders, for example. I'm sure many of you have ordered pizza online. And if you're lazy like me, that is the ultimate convenience food delivered at your door. Um, so researchers primarily at Rotman, and in fact, um, Professor Abby Goldfarb, who, used, um, who spoke earlier, he's a co-author, he's an author in this report. Um, well, these researchers looked at data from a pizza delivery restaurant that introduced an online, so web-based um, pizza delivery system to sort of complement what they had, which was um, phone-based del phone delivery and on-the-counter. And it turns out that when people order pizza online, they're more likely to make unusual and high-calorie orders. So more specifically, the average item in an order had 3% more calories and 14% more special instructions. By special instru instructions, it means like, you know, I want my pizza, half anchovies, half meatballs, I want bacon, extra cheese, and even pineapples sprinkled on it. So I don't know if that uh, suits your appetite, but uh, it'd be kind of um, weird to imagine yourself making that kind of order in front of a human being at a counter. But online, people don't have to feel embarrassed about revealing their true preferences about their um, diet habits or their pizza desires. And online, you don't need to worry about making orders as simple as possible just so that you don't um, get judged for being difficult. Another feature of screens is that it displays information differently. 
For instance, um, a lot of shopping sites look like the image on your left. Basically, a lot of options are presented to you at the same time, and then you see the product at the same time as you see the price. Now, compare this with your shopping experience in the physical world. You probably think about you know, entering a store, you find something that catches your eye, you go um, examine it a bit more closely, you look at the material, and then you sort of see the price tag and you see, do I want to pay? How much do I want to pay for this? So basically, you are considering how much you like the product first and then deciding how much to pay. In the online format, though, where the price is more salient from the beginning, you're more likely to think in terms of trade-offs between um, the product and the price. And screens can also easily facilitate comparisons between similar items by breaking it down into its individual level attributes. So um, you can see sort of the example on your right with a comparison of different phones based on their attributes. Um, it makes it easier online for people to make substantial trade-off analyses between different products that are in your consideration set. Well, let's move on to um, connectivity. So when we're always connected to the internet, we have instant access to all sorts of interesting information, and a lot of the times that turns out to be other people's behavior. There is aggregate level preferences, like you see like um, the top three most popular books on Amazon. You can also go on Kickstarter to see which projects have been um, funded and have been most popular. But you are also constantly exposed to the preferences of other individuals that you know personally. So social media sites and apps connected to your social media accounts are really good at sharing all these information about people who are in your social network, like where they checked in, the kind of brands they like, what the kind of music they're listening to. And this mere knowledge of what other people are doing actually influences our choice. And particularly when we don't know what we want or we don't have strong preferences, the easiest thing to do is kind of you know, follow what your peers are doing. Another feature um, of the connected world that I want to point out is that now individuals can actively seek out feedback from others. So on the right um, for you, um, you see a version of an app that allows you to get real-time feedback on your own choices. So in this app, um, basically, you know, there's a photo of something that someone wants to purchase, and you can get immediate feedback from others who are also using the app. And connectivity also anchors us on other people's choices. So a recent survey by Edelman showed that when it comes to credible advice, we rely on someone like me just as much as we re rely on experts. To the extent that we can observe the behavior so easily of people who we think are like us, our choices are much more likely to be influenced by the, the choices that other people are making. Um, and this is actually widely documented. You know, investors tend to enter the market more when other people are entering the market, and um, they're also likely to choose to invest in certain stocks, um, depending on you know, what kind of stocks the people around them have indicated interest in. And given this, you can actually imagine giving people a reference point for complex decisions, like how much to save for retirement or the type of investment portfolio that you could consider by providing an anchor like you know, similar people like you have chosen X, Y, and Z. And finally, choice engines. So online, there's a lot of um, complexity out there, and a lot of that complexity and effort that's required in decision making can actually be outsourced to what we call choice engines. And um, choice engines, you can think of them as tools that um, will help you make decisions. So on your left, it's a mortgage calculator. There's also iTunes Genius, which kind of curates um, different playlists that you might be interested in. There's also um, Netflix uh, recommended um, TV shows based on your past history. And then there's also other um, types of choice engines where you kind of input the information that you, know, you want. Um, for instance, if I want to rent a new place in Toronto, I can put like the location, how many rooms I want to have, and it basically narrows down a large amount of available choices to things that you're actually interested in. And it turns out that people are even okay with clicking a little bit more as long as they feel like they're getting closer to um, what they were looking for. And finally, um, there are other advanced technology solutions that fundamentally change how we do things. So for instance, robo-advisors is an example. It's basically um, financial advisors that operate 100% online using technology and algorithms to help you build and manage your financial portfolio. 
So they're kind of taking on the role of human financial advisors in the digital world, and they're doing it cheaper, and you might even argue that they're doing it better because they can keep a cool head compared to an average human. Well, so the point here is that consumer online is different, or consumer behavior online is different. And with these unique features that we talked about, um, the decision making in the online environment is fundamentally just different from decision making in the offline world. So what are the market implications for this? In particular, how do these different behaviors manifest in the market? Well, let's imagine there are two worlds. One that is 100% offline, so everything is happening in the physical world, and another world in which everything is online, everything is happening in the cloud. Well, there are at least two ways in which the fully online economy is different. First, for domains in which people have no preferences, they're much more likely to be influenced by behavior of their peers, especially given the more social decision-making process online. So essentially, the result is that the more popular products will become even more popular because it's much more easy to imitate people online. And hence, as you can see in the pink um, chart, the head of the graph is much taller. And second, for those who have rare preferences, they're more likely to validate their preferences by finding people online who actually have similar preferences as them. So let's say that, um, to give an example, you like this esoteric band that not many people know about. You know, it's not really in the mainstream, so you don't hear it on radio, and if you go to stores, it's hard to find elbows for them. If you are in a completely physical world with these physical space constraints, then you can't, it's gonna be pretty hard to find social validation for you know, your, this rare preference that you have because you feel like nobody else cares about it. On the other hand though, if you consider the 100% online world or a world where there is some online market, um, the online world has no limits on inventory, so it's much easier for people to find validation for all sorts of rare preferences. And that's why um, the result would be, as you can see, the longer tail, uh, meaning more distinctiveness in consumer preferences. So the online environment is a completely different playing field with different rules, as I've emphasized multiple times. And um, before I conclude, I'm gonna just leave you with one last question, which is how can we better design products and services for people, for humans like you and me, who are now more and more shifting, or rapidly shifting online? Thank you.